Hello, Americans. This is Orson Welles. A year ago, I stood before this same CBS microphone in this same studio and said goodbye to you for the mercury. Here was our farewell. It is important for the peoples of this hemisphere to get better acquainted, and the mercury has been given the job of helping out with the introduction. Tomorrow, we leave for South America. That was a year ago. Since then, we've made motion pictures in Brazil and Mexico and visited all the American republics, gathering material and writing the script for these broadcasts. Now it's time to say goodbye again. We're going on with the job. The Mercury is still working for the coordinator of inter-American affairs. Movies and plays and later we hope more radio. We're going to go on trying to help out with the introduction. Senora, Senora America, we want you to shake hands with Mr. and Mrs. America. Stories and music, poetry and jokes. All the mediums we can work in, all the languages we know, are obediently yours in the service of a big idea called Pan-Americanism. Big idea and also a big word. I wish it weren't. It ought to be just as easy to say Pan-Americanism as it is to understand it. My own contact with Pan-Americanism began with a delicately filigreed souvenir spoon from the Pan-American Exposition clearly labeled sterling silver. At the inquisitive age of seven, I found this tiny spoon among my grandmother's jealously guarded treasures in the old glass reliquary in the living room, along with a dance program which, curiously enough, did not have my grandfather's name in it. And the prescription for an asthma remedy. Orson, are you meddling in my things again? Even as a child, I recognized the merit of diversion as a method of defense. So I promptly asked, what does Pan-Americanism mean, Grandma? As far as I'd been able to figure it out, from the engraved map in the bowl of the spoon, the narrow strip of Central America must be the handle for some fantastic two-headed frying pan. Your grandfather's idea of a wedding anniversary was always to trace off to an exposition. Patiently or stubbornly, perhaps, I asked again. But what does Pan-American mean, Grandma? She seemed puzzled as she looked at me through the upper half of her glasses. Uh, Pan-American means uh, the Monroe Doctrine or something. Something to do with us and those people down Panama way, I suppose. They showed off a display of how they make blankets down there. And as nice colors as I ever did see. A little incomplete, perhaps, but somehow it made me feel friendly toward those people down Panama Way. Their bright colors. I learned only a little more of our southern neighbors in school. Brazil. The area of Brazil is 3,285,316 square miles. The Republic has a population of 40,272,650. School, I learned that the people to the south of us included many races. Portuguese, Italian, Spanish, German, Russian, Negro, Indian, and some Irish. Very much like our own classroom. Miranda? Vanity? Garcia? O'Leary? Present. Smith? Present. Well? Uh, present and so forth. We will all face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, individual, with liberty and justice for all. It was later, much later, that I learned about the tango. I went to the movies, read books. I was told of dark-eyed senioritas, of pampas moons, gauchos, and wild palomino ponies. Then I learned the rumba. I heard about Latin lovers and uh, the barbarous jungles, fiestas, bandits, revolutions, and tamales, hot tamales. 
Somehow the feeling of friendliness I'd known as a child escaped me. I was a gringo. And my friends from down Panama Way were Latin. A gulf wider and deeper than the Rio Grande separated me from my neighbors. Them from me. If I can only begin to tell you tonight how shallow and narrow that gulf really is. I will have accomplished what it took me a journey through our entire hemisphere to realize. Como vai você, José? Então, como vai passando sua senhora e criança? O que é que você pensa a respeito das últimas notícias enviadas de Casa Blanca, hein? You know what that means? It means, hello, Joe, what do you know? How's the wife and kids? And what do you think of the news from Casa Blanca? Tu sabes, chiquito, que há uma guerra e tenho que lutar. Espere-me. That's the way a Mexican boy says... Listen, sweetheart, I got to enlist. You understand. Wait for me. That was the dark-eyed senorita he was talking to, and that other was your Latin lover. It's the sameness I'm talking about now. Sameness in spite of difference. Different sounds to the words. But the same idea. Different colors, but the same spirit. Different churches, but the same faith. Different liquor, but the same hangover. Different jokes, but the same laughter. Different nations. The same humanity. Thank God for the differences. Because it's out of those differences that culture grows. And grows big in all directions at once. Thank God for the southern drawl and the Yankee twang. Thank God for samba, swing. For baseball and bullfights. For the poets and the painters. For Mexico's Orozco. For Portinari of Brazil. Queros of Argentina. Thank God for Walt Disney and Canteen Plus, El Gran Otello, Carmen Miranda. Thank God for Chavez and Villa Lobos and a thousand unknown troubadours who improvised the people's songs. Thank God for Mark Twain and Mickey Rooney and all the others, living and dead, whose different voices are heard in our hemisphere, voices whose eternal sameness is contained in the tremendous proposition that all men are created equal. The very foundation of peace on earth is understanding between men. Strong magic acknowledging no time and space. The understanding that comes with knowledge is a perfect time machine. You can twist the dial of history and listen in wherever you like. For instance, let's say we want to tune in on the city of Washington, D.C., the year 1816. Honor <coughs> Baron to be heard. Will the senator yield to the gentleman from Kentucky? John Randolph has been ridiculing a junior senator by the name of Henry Clay, who spoke for a diplomatic mission to South America. Mr. Clay's enthusiasm is a fervor recently acquired in Europe. A spirit which is out of place in the United States of America. The differences between the American nations are too great. Socially, economically, and politically. The holdouts say those same things today. But the differences they talk about are just the ones you'll find in any of our own large cities. Well, people seem to get along all right. Any New York subway car is an international express. No one's really killed in the rush. Pan-Americanism is an unnatural movement. Mr. President. I recognize Senator Sharp, Kentucky. Mr. President, I wonder how many colleagues can be the spectators of a struggle for liberty and independence by any portion of the human family and feel indifferent of the result. Will the senator yield? <laughs> the senator will gladly yield to Henry Clay. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Mr. President, it was the doctrine of King... But man was too ignorant to govern himself. It was the doctrine of kings that man was too ignorant to govern himself. Bolivar speaking. Simon Bolivar, South America, the liberator. He stands framed against the clean, cold sky as he reads to his men. It was the doctrine of kings that man was too ignorant to govern himself. I maintain that an oppressed people are authorized whenever they can to rise and break their fetters. Those are the words I bring you from a senator of the United States Congress, Henry Clay. The wind blew across the mountains with the sound of Spanish cannon. 
and snapped the black streamer which flew from Bolivar's lance. The men shifted their weight, watching the emblem on the streamer, a skull and bones, with the words of Patrick Henry, liberty or death. My friends, these words from our neighbor to the north give final assurance that we do not fight in vain. America, already I see it serve as a bond, as center, as emporium to the human family. May God grant that we may install a Congress here to study the high interest of peace and war with the other nations of the world. The roots of Pan-Americanism lie buried with Bolivar deep in the rich, fertile soil he loved and freed. Let's turn the dial of history again, past the failure of Bolivar's assembly at Panama, 1826, past the narrow national errors and misinterpretations of the Monroe Doctrine. Let's tune in on the most spectacular year, 1889, Washington, D.C. October 2nd, 1889. I call to order the first Pan-American Conference. The scope and objective of this conference is consultative and rudimentary only. The conference will be wholly without power to... And so it began, this Pan-American partnership, weak, uncertain, a newborn infant. And across the sea in Austria, in the same year of our Lord, 1889. It's a fine boy, Lee. It's a fine boy. Look how he holds his head up already. He'll make his mark, this boy will. You'll be proud to have delivered this child here, Doctor. Well, I find it better to disclaim any credit, good or bad, for the human beings I bring into the world. Here, shake it over. <laughs> Eighteen eighty-nine. The birth date of two infants who were to grow into mortal enemies, Pan-Americanism and Adolf Hitler, nay Schickel Gruber. History indulges such contradictions. Take, for example, another year, 1933. Now we're in a small clay hut somewhere in South America. Jose tries to tune his new radio while his wife prepares food against the return of their son, who uh, helps build radios in the new radio factory. For such a price, it's a fine new radio. Listening to the inaugural address of the 32nd President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In the field of world policy, I would dedicate this nation to the policy of the good neighbor. Good evening, Father. Be quiet, that one. The neighbor who resolutely respects himself, and because he does so, respects the rights of others. The neighbor who respects his obligations and respects the sanctity of his agreement in and with a world of neighbors. Jew Franklin Rosenfeld, I quote the words of Germany's new leader. Whoever would really wish from his heart for the victory of the pacifist conception of this world must devote himself by every means to the conquest of the world by the Germans. Warren, there is something strange about this radio. Oh, no, they're all like that. Uh, Senor Schmidt at the factory told us it's, uh, it's because we're closer to Germany. Don't worry, Juan has learned. Today he works in another factory and he's a member of the Latin American Confederation of Workers. I'd like you to hear what Vincente Lombardo Toledano, the head of the Confederation, told me in Mexico. We have joined the United States and the other people fighting in the Orient and in Europe against Hitler and the complices. There can be only two attitudes, against Hitler or in favor of Hitler. It is absurd to speak of neutrality because the neutral is but an ambushed fascist 
cynical and cowardly. Today, the peoples of two great continents are fighting shoulder to shoulder. Twenty-one nations of the Americas marching to the same battle hymn. And we didn't come together by a strange coincidence. And it wasn't just luck. And it wasn't an accident. We men and women of the Americas came together out of a common heritage, a tradition planted a hundred years deep. We were born out of revolution, all 21 of us. And we cut our teeth on a declaration of independence. Today we're still fighting the same fight. Good neighbors thrown together to protect their homes, that's the picture. People, just plain people. Plenty of personal problems going their own way, never getting to know their neighbors except for a good morning and a nice day, isn't it? Lots of us never knew that man who's the air raid warden till he dropped in to look over the house one evening about a year ago. And it's the same way with nations. Friendly, know each other's names. That's about all. Then comes the crisis. A fire, an air raid alert. And over a single night, acquaintances become friends. Neighbors become allies and comrades in arms. Sometimes it doesn't take a crisis. I remember in Mexico seeing a young girl with a group of tourists in the United States. She was so carried away by a passion for flowers that she found herself without enough centavos to pay for the orchids, gardenias, and carnations she'd selected. I was asked to interpret, and it was only after I'd pushed through the group of tourists that I saw the face of the little flower girl. She smiled such a smile as I will never forget. It was as though she had been confronted with a miracle. I found she understood the situation. You like who's done daddy with me, Nya? Literally translated, the young lady says, if you like them, keep them, little one. But she can't afford. The gringa tried to give the flowers back, but the Indian girl would have no part of it. She was genuinely delighted to find the gringa had a heart like herself. And that she loved her flowers. Flowers of Mexico. Here. Ask her to take this scarf. But before I could speak, the Indian girl had refused. No, no, niña. It's a regalo. When I told the gringa the flowers were a gift, she understood. I think we all understood. The Faisanita just discovered that gringos have souls. That they're human beings. But nothing stands between them and us. America, all of it. That big two-headed frying pan. My grandmother's souvenir spoon. America's recognizing its unity of purpose. Sometimes slowly out of the necessity of crisis, more often through the recognition of a common destiny. Not the manifest destiny of Yankee imperialism and gringo superiority, but the destiny conceived by Bolivar, a great cultural and economic, political and intellectual partnership of equal nations. On the docks of Baltimore and New York, the longshoremen speak with surprise of a new and startling phenomenon. I don't get it, Pop. What is all this stuff? It's your factory. That's what it is, son. <laughs> you mean I'm lifting a whole blasted factory? That's right, son. A whole blasted factory. From conveyor belts to time clocks. Last month, the first of some 500 factories we weren't using for the war were shipped out of Baltimore for Latin America. That's the good neighbor policy. That's inter-American democracy. As my good friend Luis Quintanilla, the Mexican ambassador of the Soviet Union, sees it. Not only the formal, theoretical, political democracy of our several constitutions, but the natural, tangible, economic democracy in our people's way of living. Pan-Americanism submits that being a nation is a dignity, a trust, a responsibility. But being a nation is a highly professional matter involving the highest professional ethics. Professional people don't have rivals or competitors, but colleagues. Each individual stands to gain by the good professional and ethical conduct of every other individual in the society. Colleagues understand the necessity of not resorting to brass knuckles as instruments of policy. Well, what do they settle their arguments with, then? Well, what do you do if someone sues your friend? Beat his brains out? No. I get a lawyer or leave town. Nations can't leave town. 
So, in a manner of speaking, they get a lawyer. Several South American disputes have been settled by mediation, arbitration, and conciliation. And that's only the beginning. Science and knowledge are breaking through the barriers of time and space. Only a short while ago, our president and commander-in-chief conferred with Winston Churchill in North Africa. Today, he's in Brazil. Men are learning to think in three dimensions. At long last, our understanding can encompass the words of Abraham Lincoln. The strongest tie of human sympathy, apart from the family relationship, is that uniting the workers of all nations, tongues, and kindred. Out of and beyond the concept of Pan-Americanism has grown the organized form of world democracy, the United Nations. Out of the meeting at Casablanca, we have renewed our solemn pledge to fight this war to ultimate total victory. And it will follow by the simple logic of historic elimination that when we've destroyed those who advocate a world order of slavery, poverty, and ignorance, we will be one step nearer the defeat of slavery, poverty, and ignorance themselves. Over the Americas, over the continents and waters of the Western world, watches a spirit. I will not go back. Out of the mists of time, the spirit came. In the beginning, there was universal ooze. And monsters roamed the uncertain earth. Incredible reptiles haunted the world. And there was no man. Then they died. Great reptiles had their dim, their mighty day, and died. Then came the jungles. I was a foul and hairy thing. Monstrous and witless life. So something happened. I lifted myself on my knuckles, the brute that I was, trying to stand, lifting myself on my wrists, pushing myself up on my knuckles. And this took a million years or more. But I stood up. I stood. And I walked direct. The world was hostile. The jungle was close, close at the back of the creature that dared to be more than creature. The jungle stood ready to take back its own. I will not go back. So he stands, this man spirit, watching over the continents, anxious of his destiny. He broods and waits, waits for some proof that man can live in peace, proof that mankind can repudiate the doctrine of might and the brute rule by claw and fang, talon and beak. The spirit of man waits to learn if the jungle is leveled, for if it still lives, rankly, living and breathing and waiting, to take back its own. Man may stand and look at the sun, or he may squat on his haunches again and howl at the moon. I am man. I have seen the summits to which men may lift themselves. I have survived Babylon, Nineveh, and Tyre. I have survived the flooding Nile, the rising and the falling of the continents. My flint and my bronze and my bones are scattered over the world throughout time. I have been kin to Plato, to Socrates, to Michelangelo, Galileo, Raphael, Shakespeare. Confucius has taught his simple art of goodness. Buddha has rested beneath his tree. Mohammed has journeyed to the mountain in my time. The Nazarene has mounted to Golgotha and higher. I am man. I have drawn nearer to it on recent wings. If I fly, I compute. I reason and have rules of logic. I sing, communicate. I speak and write my speeches upon space and void. I look up at the sun. I am man. I will not go back. This perhaps is our last chance. Here in the West, our chance is for a perfect and a bloodless victory. Pan-Americanism is a name for that victory. 
Not a Pan-Americanism of the alarmed moment, looking only for temporary safety in numbers. Not an expedient for the advantage of the big fellow nation or the imperialist. Not a cynic or heads I win tales you lose Pan-Americanism and the devil take the hindmost. But a union formed in the conviction that this is it. That the moment is urgent. And the wrong road leads back to the jungle. All the world looks to half the world for a way to peace. And we are that half of the world. We are charged with giving that we may receive. America, the mother of republics, may yield magnificently once more. Or go forever barren. I asked our vice president, Henry A. Wallace, to write us a message for broadcasting. Here it is. The new democracy looks to the future, not to the past. It looks to the rich soil and bright sunshine of America for strength. It does not exclude the old world, but it will develop its own strength to help the old world. The spirit of man stands watch upon the western continent. I have come this far... I will not go back. So be it. We will see. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our time's up. The series is over. The Mercury Theater and the Office of the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs extend sincerest thanks to the Columbia Broadcasting System for making these programs possible. Your obedient servant thanks Lucian Marowick for his music and Vlad Gluskin for conducting it. Finally, he'd like to thank you for listening and for the interest you've shown in what we've had to talk about. We very much hope to be able to come back to the air again soon. Until then, we remain as always obedient to yours. After the Wega, the logo. Good night, Americans. have been listening to the concluding program in a series about the other Americas, in which the Columbia Broadcasting System has presented Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater. The Columbia Broadcasting System is the originator of South America's network of stations, La Cadena de las Americas. In the Southern Hemisphere, as well as in this hemisphere, CBS provides daily programs of news, entertainment, and recreation to bring about a closer understanding among Americans everywhere. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.